Uh, the, we're going to be changing a little bit here. Uh, so mm, normally uh, at plant biology meetings, we don't have economists come, but I actually think uh, economists, I, I work with economists quite often, uh, and I think that they bring a, a different perspective uh, to us. So our next speaker uh, is Phil Party. Uh, he's from the University of Minnesota, but you will tell from his accent that he's not originally from Minnesota. Uh, and um, he has worked on uh, food policy issues and uh, understanding uh, how to interplay uh, economics with, with uh, agricultural productivity. So I'm going to stop there and leave it to Phil. Uh, thank you very much, Peggy, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, uh, full disclosure, I uh, did complete an agricultural science degree at the University of Adelaide many, many years ago and took one economics course as a filler course uh, in my last year of that uh, uh, program of study and uh, unfortunately have spent a, a career working in economics and not agricultural science or actually the, the Australian wine industry was where I was initially destined to go and most of my mates are now senior winemakers in Australia and when I go back and visit I wonder who's had the best 30 years of their career. Um, my path uh, crossed with Carrie years ago. I was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the interplay between economics and biology uh, and uh, I was a renegade member of the system-wide genetic resource program committee, which was basically the guys and gals who ran the gene banks around the CG system. And I remember attending a meeting in Lima, Peru many, many years ago, and Bent Scoveman, who some of you may know, who ran the wheat part of the gene bank at Simit, uh, asked me uh, to do a little study on how much does it cost to conserve seeds in perpetuity. Uh, and like Carrie, I stumble on the in perpetuity. That's a hard thing to, to do. Uh, but we actually did that study for CIMIT uh, and did a bunch of other studies for the CG system. And that type of economic analysis fed into uh, the policy processes that uh, gave rise to the Conservation Genetic Resource Fund. Uh, you need to know how much this is going to cost. It's a very e easy question to ask. It turned out to be a hard question to answer. Uh, I'm still chipping away at looking at how much things cost. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is give you a sense of uh, how much uh, uh, resources are going in or not going into the sorts of things you folks do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but to step back and take a, a long-run perspective on that uh, and look at it uh, from a global perspective. Um, but before doing that, I'd like to just sort of give a quick tour de force uh, from an economic perspective on where agriculture has come in the last half a century. Uh, and some of the basic facts are known by most of us, but a couple may not be. Um, what I've done is picked up some key factoids about the supply and demand side of agriculture in this one slide, uh, looking back in 1961 uh, versus 2010. And you can see, looking at population, we know we've more than doubled population from just over 3 billion to now just over 7 billion. Uh, agricultural labour, uh, it's an imprecise measure I've got here, but it's the only one we've got available on a global scale, didn't double. It certainly increased, but we've certainly had during this period of time lots of countries that have flushed a lot of labour out of agriculture and continuing to do so. So we're in uh, systems where we've got some countries still increasing the labour force in agriculture, many diminishing the labour force in agriculture. And so we've gone from about 0.8 billion to about 1.3 billion. Uh, uh, workers in agriculture over this 50-year period. Uh, on the land side, as Carrie alluded to, we've had much more modest increase in the global footprint of agriculture. Uh, we've gone from about 4.1 billion to about 4.6 billion hectares. The lighter shade on those bars are the, the splits in each of these variables that, that uh, occur in the, in the low and middle income countries. The darker part of the bars are the splits that occur in the high income countries. The remarkable thing is, though, with that fairly modest increase in the land base, a modest and in many parts of the world reducing labour use in agriculture, we've had this massive increase in the value of agricultural production. That's what VOP stands for. So this is the gross value of agricultural production. It has gone from $746 billion to $2.3 trillion. This is flushing out inflation. This is in real terms. We've had a three-fold increase in the amount of agricultural output across all output. Uh, crops, livestock, the lot. So this is a, a historical, remarkable achievement uh, that I think uh, 
many of us in the room sort of take for granted. Uh, lots of people out there in uh, the real world don't actually understand what the, the transformation that's taken place in production agriculture over this half century. Uh, against that backdrop of in massive increase in output, we've had episodes of concern, and we're now in another one. Uh, so back in the mid-1960s, we had uh, an outpouring of press around uh, a significant hike or spike at that point of time in uh, uh, commodity prices, and there was Club of Rome and other sorts of uh, uh, information around about the prospects for agriculture going forward, which uh, had many people concerned and gave rise to political pressures that, that uh, brought together the, the sort of collective funding instrument we now know as the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research. Um, those price pressures seemed to go away for a while, but they reappeared again in 2007, where we had this massive uh, run-up in commodity prices, a slight drop in commodity prices in the following year or two. And then since 2010, 2013, we've had sustained increases in the prices of basic uh, uh, commodities, such that, uh, and these are substantial increases in prices, that they're hovering at around double the price level globally that they were 10 years ago. So that's a bit of a game changer. So there's a concern about where we are and looking forward where we might be going with respect to the never-ending battle between shifting out the supply curve and the growth in demand due to driven by growth in population uh, and per capita income. And one aspect that's often uh, uh, not counted in this is the massive change in demographics that's occurring globally, which we've been doing a bit of work on my group uh, about, which is also going to have a measurable impact on, on food systems going forward. So, coupled with these price concerns, uh, folks like myself and others look around and look at what's going on with respect to the sort of supply shifters uh, of agriculture, and particularly with respect to com um, uh, productivity growth. And there are warning signs there. It's hard to sort of tease out blips from trends in these sorts of data, uh, but when we look at uh, fairly elegant measures that economists use, like multi-factor productivity measures, where we try to get a very comprehensive measure of output and see how fast that's going up relative to measured inputs. We uh, see things like a halving of multi-factor productivity growth rates in the US, for example, in the pre versus, versus post-90 period. So for the three decades prior to 1990, US multi-factor productivity growth was around 2% per annum, just under. Uh, now, as best we can measure it, it's barely 1% per annum. That starts to raise concerns for me. If we look at uh, crop yields uh, and look at the number of countries in this slide, just as a, as a quick one slider, the number of countries for these major, say, three staple food crops where yields are growing statistically slower post-1990 than they were pre-1990, uh, again, starts to raise concerns about whether or not we have to plough in the planet to feed the next two to three billion people that we're projected to uh, have on the planet. So my talk today is going to focus on where does this productivity come from. Uh, Kerry talked about the 10,000 plus years of farmer experimentation, which got us up to 1900. Uh, and thereafter, we started to use science to breed crop varieties. And most of the economic evidence is pretty compelling that the lion's share of contemporary growth and productivity is now not through informal tinkering and experimentation, as important as that was and still tends to be at a micro level, and particularly for large uh, swaths of the world where I spend a lot of my time working on in Africa and elsewhere, the lion's share of the yield growth and productivity growth is attributable to more formal forms of R&D, both by the public and private sectors. Uh, to give you a sense of how dramatic uh, that research productivity relationship is, here's data on tracking for the last, since 1949, the growth in output in the US. So we went from about just under $30 billion worth of output in 1949 to a staggering $282 billion worth of output. Uh, the, the light pink area on the bottom shows you the share of that output that we would have got if we relied just on increasing our input use with zero productivity gains. So we would have increased output from 1949 to 2007 by a bare 22% if all we were relying on was using more fertilizer and chemicals and land and labor and things like that. We've changed the mix of those inputs dramatically, and this we do a bunch of fancy economics to come up with measures that, that abstract from problems that are induced by changes in the mix of inputs and outputs. So overall, about a fifth of the output growth is attributable to inputs. The rest of it comes from something else, 
we give it a fancy name, we call it productivity growth. It's, uh, uh, Abramovich 60 years ago said it's literally a measure of our ignorance. It's part of the growth in output that's not attributable to inputs. And what we attribute that to largely is technical change. We change the technical relationships between inputs and outputs through the things you folks do in changing how we produce, what we produce, when and where and so forth. Uh, and so the estimates are that about 78% of the output that was realized in 2007 was directly attributable to productivity growth since 1949. That's a massive share of the output growth, and these sorts of results hold up uh, internationally, not just in the US. The problem comes in this relationship between investing in the R&D and realizing that output is that there are very, very long lags in that process, and I'm probably preaching to the choir. Many of you know the nature of these lags, uh, but many of you might, may not know how long those lags are. And they're not a year or two, they're actually decades. And here's uh, uh, a slide showing you when economists first started looking at where does productivity growth come from and what's the relationship between R&D spending and productivity growth, up until the 40s and 50s, we didn't know where productivity growth came from. Uh, it was conceived in the literature as, quote, manna from heaven. Uh, this technical change just fell out of the skies, you know. We didn't have an understanding that it actually there was economic activity and formal investments in R&D that gave rise to that productivity growth. And a very famous economist at Chicago, Zvi Grilichus, did the very first study on trying to quantify the relationships between R&D and output, and it was with agriculture. Um, and Zvi, in his specification, reckoned it was a five-year lag, that you put your dollars in and within five years you had your productivity impacts. Well, we know that that's not quite how it happens. Uh, I did some study with some colleagues recently that show that uh, empirically the lags in the US between investing in R&D and the productivity impacts are at least 50 years long. It doesn't mean you wait 50 years to have an impact, but for the time you spend a buck to when you exacerbate its productivity impacts, that process takes 50 years to play its hand out on average. Some research has a shorter timeline, other researchers has a longer timeline, but on average, that's the, the timeline that the, the evidence suggests. And people question that and say, well, I think that's too long. Uh, so I counter and say, well, maybe not. So I consulted uh, folks like yourself in the public and private sectors, and I developed a bunch of technology timelines here, and I tracked the key scientific steps in the public and private sectors that gave rise to technologies that we all know about, like hybrid corn and BT corn and Roundup Ready soybean. Uh, and to the best I could estimate, it took 59 years from the first focused work in genetics around hybridizing corn to when we actually had a commercializable release of that technology that was actually used by farmers. It wasn't in the gleam of the eye of the researchers or on the experiment station farm, it was actually being used in commercial agriculture. And until it's used in commercial agriculture, it doesn't have a measurable productivity impact, as great as that technology might be. 59 years for hybrid corn, 96 years for BT corn. Uh, we think this science happens really quickly. If you actually track the sort of lineage, it's an imprecise thing I know, but the lineage of the science, nearly 100 years to get that technology from the glimmer in the eye of one of you folks sitting here to a commercializable technology, and 26 years for Roundup Ready soybean. That's just to the point of commercial release. Now you've got to have an impact on productivity. You've got to have farmers using it. So I had a graduate student finish up a really great PhD on uh, looking back at 120 years of corn yield developments in the US, and the, the, the thesis goes on to a whole bunch of other different things I'm going to touch on today, but what Jason did was put together some data on the big waves of technology that's impacted the US corn sector, as best we could estimate it, and so the vertical axis measures the acreage in corn that's being impacted by one of these technologies. So in here we've got, this is, hybrid, uh, the area sown to hybrid corn in the US going up over time. Uh, the area on which nitrogen fertilizer was being used. So it might be a, a shock to many, but up until around the Second World War, barely half of the corn acreage in the US was receiving any uh, commercial fertilizer. And the application rates were abysmally low. So it takes significant time to roll these technologies out. And here's how long it took to roll each one of those clusters of technology out to when 80% of the corn acreage in the US was using that technology. This isn't a year or two, these are another decades or two. And this is in a country where we think we've got very efficient extension systems and things work, 
Uh, think about this in sub-Saharan Africa where things don't work quite as well, how long it takes to get technologies out in farmers' fields. You add up the, the pre-commercialization R&D lags on top of these adoption lags, and I reckon you're in the 50-year plus range for most technologies that are out there. So the seeds of what's happening in farmers' fields today were sown 20, 30 years ago, by and large. And the decisions we take now are going to impact global agriculture in 2030, 2040, by and large. They'll have an impact between now and then, but their maximum impact will be around that period of time. So how are we doing with respect to investments in R&D globally? And because I'm, I hope we made the case that we need to think long term in this, these data, these are new hard-won data that I've been working on for a while, some of them haven't seen the published light of day yet, that will show you the evolution of uh, uh, investments in R&D globally for the most part uh, with respect to uh, the last 30, 40 years. I'll start with the, the hardest data. Uh, this is my measured view of what's happened amongst the high-income countries with respect to investments in private food and agricultural R&D uh, over the last uh, 40 years. So we've gone, and this is in real inflation-adjusted terms. For, so we, my estimates are we've gone from about 4.3 billion bucks in 1970 uh, in the rich countries, the OECD countries, up to $17.5 billion uh, in 2009. Uh, the natural inclination when you talk about food and agriculture and private sector research is to think of the biological companies and the efforts of the Monsantos and the Syngentas and the Pioneer DuPonts and so forth. Important as they are, that shouldn't be the first thing you think about. Actually, the lion's share of that investment's got nothing to do with the farm. It's post-farm food processing. And if you look at where the value added in agriculture is, the lion's share of the value added in agriculture is post-farm food processing. As best I can remember, half of the food expenditures in the US now are from food consumed outside the home. Half of the expenditures on food and agriculture. I think in 1940, it used to be 20% of the expenditures. So there's a lot of economic value uh, after the, the stuff's left the farm. And that's where the returns to investments in innovation and so forth can be got by and large. So most of it's are 46% of all of the OECD rich country food and ag research is food processing, food and beverage processing to be clear. Uh, in the US it's just over a third, about 36%. The agriculture component in these data series includes the biotechnology companies and things of that nature. Uh, they have a higher presence in the US. It's about nearly a quarter of all of the private sector R&D by my estimates, and about a fifth across the OECD countries, uh, as best we can estimate. That's a big chunk of change. There's a lot of activity going on in the private sector, but it's sort of a different nature. And when you peel around in the details, they're doing different things. That, that mix between food and machinery and chemicals and so forth is very different for, say, public sector research than it is for private sector research. So there's a very complicated uh, innovative dance going on between the public and private sector. They're not the same thing. What's been going on with respect to the public sector is huge sea change with respect to what research is being done where by whom. So the big story, the long run story, is quite positive in some sense. So again, in inflation adjusted terms, we've gone from, uh, we've basically in increased in real terms the amount of investment in the public sector worldwide by about sixfold over the last half century. We've gone from about 5.4 billion uh, to nearly 34 billion bucks worth of investment. Uh, so the size of the global public sector ag R&D pie has expanded dramatically. Uh, where in the world that research takes place is changing substantially. So my estimates are that the rich countries, the high income countries, uh, these using World Bank cutoffs for high, middle and low income countries, they accounted for about 55, 56% of that total back in 1960. They now account for 48% of the total. The market share of the US, if you can read the fine print there, has dropped precipitously. The US has gone from 21% of that global public pie uh, down to 13%. Uh, and as you might guess, the change is occurring uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, if you add India, China, and the other Asian countries together, their uh, global market share has gone from a fifth to nearly a third in that period of time. So where in the world that research is taking place is changing uh, very substantially. And so these are global numbers. And so when you see shares change like that in economic indicators, that means something fundamental is going on here. <coughs> 
Uh, interestingly, uh, I was telling Peggy and colleagues uh, earlier this morning, these data take a, they, they don't just fall off trees, they're not manna from heaven, they take a long time to put together. Um, and this is, was my measured, or our measured view of the world up until the last six months or so, uh, where we have trends in real terms in research spending, the top line is the, the high income countries, the, the middle line is the middle income countries, and the low line there uh, is the low income countries, and that's what the world looked like, this trending up uh, till 2000. And this is what happened in the last decade. Massive sea change. Uh, and I'll show you why, but essentially it's the rich countries slowing down, stagnating, pulling back from investments in public agricultural research, and the middle income countries in particular, and particularly a couple of lions and elephants and tigers in that room, ramping up their spending, which is driving these big global shifts in where in the world innovation agriculture from the public sector side is coming from. Interestingly, a colleague of mine at the World Bank gave me this hint. When I, in this previous slide, I classified low, middle and high income countries in terms of where countries are today. That is, what is today's high income countries, today's low income countries, today's middle income countries. Uh, that's the left hand slide just repeated. This slide here characterised countries in terms of high, middle and low as to where they were in 1961. And this is sort of pretty interesting. Uh, this is the middle income countries as classified by 1961 now constitute the largest share of the pie in public sector agricultural R&D. Uh, this is uh, the high income countries and these are yesteryear's low-income countries. So this is China, was a low-income country in 1961. India, these are driving. So if you're thinking about sweeps of history and think about how agriculture feeds into, uh, and research investments feed into agriculture, sort of looking from then to now and looking from now back then, you get very different views of the world. I think this is sort of pretty interesting and sort of opens up some fundamental rethinking about how agriculture is driven by investments in R&D. Those changing sort of spatial uh, senses of investment are coming about by big shifts in the rates of growth in R&D spending. So what I've got here is the, the average by decade from the 1960s up to 2000 of spending growth. Uh, and so here's the high income country. So there's a bunch of probably older colleagues in the room. When you join uh, the land grant system or the USDA in the 1960s and 70s, things were pretty good. Uh, budgets were growing. Uh, in real terms by 8 or 9% per year for a decade or so. And you can see there's been this ratcheting down and down and down. And, and this is across all of the high income countries. So it's not just here in the US. In fact, in the US, in real terms, the US has been cutting back in spending since 2002 on public sector ag, food and ag R&D. Uh, but the rest of the rich world isn't doing much better either. So we've gone from growth rates of 6, 7, 8% down to growth rates of less than 1% in real terms. Uh, the Asia-Pacific region is very different. Uh, they have been ramping up their rates of growth in R&D investments, but they've also been amongst the fastest growing agricultural economies in the world as well. Uh, 
So what's driving what is hard to tease out, but there's certainly a, a, a concordance between the rates of growth of, of agricultural output and the rates of growth of R&D spending. They sustained very high 4 to 6% rates of growth for three or four decades. You do that, that starts to make an impact. Uh, and they've actually ramped up their investment levels as best we can measure uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, a region of the world where we have lots of problems, and I'm spending a lot of my time now, is in sub-Saharan Africa, where it's a very different story. When we came off the, the back end of colonialism back in the 60s, we had a lot of foreign aid money going into sub-Saharan Africa, which saw very healthy rates of growth in public sector ag R&D spending, but it didn't last. And we had a bunch of dismal decades where we had a ratcheting down or a cutting back in R&D spending. And there's been a recovery, an uh, encouraging recovery in R&D spending in that part of the world in the last decade. But unfortunately, if you scratch below the surface, it makes you nervous that it's very thin. There's just a few countries that have recovered their rates of growth of spending. There's not a, an apparent, at least to my mind as I look at the data, widespread sustained growth in R&D spending in sub-Saharan Africa. But you can see those rates of growth are pointing to very fundamental differences in the sustained investment trajectories that have taken place with respect to where in the world you sit. And so consequently, if you look at the top 10 table, big shuffling going in in terms of who sits in that top 10 table. So back in the day, back in the early 60s, the US in real terms spent three times plus more than China. By my estimates now, China is now spending more than the US on public sector ag R&D. Uh, these countries dropped out uh, of the top 10. So my colleagues in Australia think things are pretty healthy, but they don't appear in the list anymore. Uh, well, uh, so UK, South Africa, Australia, Argentina have dropped out. Uh, and these countries have come in or moved substantially up the ranking. These are India, moved from eighth to fourth place in the ranking. New entrant Brazil, France, Spain, South Korea. So that top 10 table shuffling big time too. So at the broad aggregate level and when you go down to the country level, a big change in the pattern of R&D spending uh, as we uh, look back over the last 50 years. You'd sort of expect big countries with, with big agricultural economies to spend more on ag research than smaller agricultural economies. So economists make up this thing called an intensity of investment. And what we're simply doing here is dividing the amount of R&D spending by the value of agricultural output that's serviced by that R&D spending. Uh, and so what this is showing you is, say, for example, in the US, we're spending about $2.60, $2.70 on public sector ag R&D for every $100 worth of agricultural GDP. All right, that's what that's saying. Uh, and we've had this, in a sense, knowledge deepening or research deepening uh, of uh, the US system uh, over the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, so we're spending more uh, uh, on ag R&D relative to the size of the agricultural output than we were in yesteryear. Uh, some of that might be because you have to run harder to stand still. Once you increase your productivity levels, um, uh, it's a bit Alice in the looking glass, you, you need a lot of maintenance research, hard to estimate, but I've seen estimates around that 40 to 70% of the dollars spent in the US are just to maintain yields with respect to biotic and abiotic stresses and things of that nature, not to increase yield levels and potentials and so forth. Um, if you look at uh, elsewhere in the world, so, so there's the high income in the US countries, uh, US is similar. If you look in Asia Pacific, it might be a surprise to see that they've only been inching up their intensity of investment. So they've been running, and as I mentioned earlier, their ag economies have been growing really fast compared to ours. So although they've been ramping up their spending, they're only barely keeping up with the economic expansion of their agricultural economies. So they're just starting to move into this sort of knowledge R&D deepening uh, in their sectors now. And I'd suspect going forward, uh, they're going to start looking more like the high income countries uh, uh, in the next 50 years. And in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, despite comparatively healthy growth rates in their agricultural economies in the last few years, their intensities of investments have actually slipped so they've become less research intensive over the last 50 years, not more. So that has big implications in terms of the nature and shape of productivity gains uh, with respect to those countries. So I'm going to finish up with uh, a set of slides which I'll step through, uh, which is like a, a pseudo dynamic view of the world in terms of what's going on with ag R&D spending. And I'll just set this one slide up and then I'll let the slides uh, hopefully speak for themselves.
So what I've got in this vertical axis is this research intensity measure, how much we're investing in R&D relative to the size of our agricultural economies. Uh, and what I've done, each one of these dots represents a country. There's about 130 countries up there. Uh, and I've arranged the countries in terms of their per capita incomes. This is in 1960, all right? So we've got low-income countries here uh, with 150 to $200 per capita of output and rich countries over here. Uh, to the right. Uh, this is the world's average research intensity as of now, just over $1.50 of investment in R&D for every $100 worth of output. Uh, the size of the bubble indicates uh, something quite interesting. That is the relative size of the agricultural economies. So back in 1960, the US accounted for 13% of the world's agricultural GDP. So it's got a pretty large bubble. Uh, China as a smaller bubble, back then it accounted for 4% of the world's agricultural GDP. India, its agricultural GDP was twice the size of, the, of China's back in 1960. Uh, and we've got South Africa sitting up there, and we've got Nigeria sitting in there, and we've got Brazil sitting in there. And so the colors indicate regions. The red is Asia Pacific, the yellow uh, is Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the green is Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, the purpley color is the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and the blue is the high income countries, the rich countries. And what I'm gonna do is show you how this plays out over time in terms of how countries are getting richer, they'll move to the right, and if they increase their intensive investment, they'll move upwards over time. So just to get it on the right scale, this is the same graph just recalibrated with a, with a higher vertical scale here to allow for some intensity increase over time. And I'll step you through half a century of investments, global investments, in turn, and its consequences with respect to the size of the agricultural economy. So this is where we were back in 1960, 65, 70, 75. Huge change. This is then, this is now. And you'll see a lot of really interesting dynamics going on there. We haven't got enough time to go into them now. But you can see, for one, look at the relative sizes of the red bubbles versus the blue bubbles back then and look at their relative size now. Agricultural value has shifted across the planet, uh, more to the Asia-Pacific region than the rich countries. Um, we think of agriculture as being this very pervasive uh, sector in terms of its physical footprint on the landscape. If you look at it through an economic lens, it's a much more highly concentrated sector. Five countries account for 52% of the entire world's value of agricultural production. Five countries. In order now, they are China, the US, India, Brazil, and Indonesia. Uh, and so that's reflected in these bubbles. You can see uh, these bubbles have shifted much, heavily, much more heavily towards the, the Asian part of the world. Uh, you can see that uh, the rich countries, these blue countries up here, are in intensively investing in agricultural R&D. But if you watch the slideshow, you can see the red countries have started on this trajectory now too. They're at the cusp of starting to intensify their investments in ag R&D. So if I was a betting man, uh, one scenario is, uh, if we don't get a policy change in the rich countries, the rich countries are going to follow this trajectory down here, that they'll get richer. Uh, all the projections are that they'll get richer. Hopefully, they will. Uh, but their intensity of investment relative to the size of their agricultural sectors is likely to start declining, could decline. Uh, the Indias and the Chinas and so forth are likely to get substantially richer. And all the projections I see close not close entirely, but shrink the per capita income gap between today's middle income countries and uh, today's high income countries. Uh, and if they can keep investing at more or less the rates that they're doing, uh, and there seems to be a, a fairly sustained policy uh, incentive to do that, they may well be the people who are investing more intensively than the rich countries. Uh, if someone's standing here 50 years from now and giving this talk. Of course, all these things are endogenous to policy choices. Uh, this is just if the sort of recent past carries forward to the future. These things can be changed, uh, and so this is not a forecast by any means. It's a prediction based on a certain set of uh, uh, assumptions. So 
Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, these countries, the gold countries, sub-Saharan Africa, the yellow countries, haven't moved much in terms of average per capita income over half a century, and they certainly haven't moved much in terms of their intensity investments, and they sit well below the global average intensity of investment. So if we're looking for the prospects of productivity growth coming out of Africa, uh, that's a dismal story. We've done a bunch of other work to show perhaps one of the options is to be much more creative about research spill-ins. Research done elsewhere in the world can certainly impact uh, African agriculture, so there's lots of work going on in drought tolerance and things of that nature. Uh, nitrogen use efficiency and so forth, it could be very helpful for African agriculture if we can get those technologies into the hands of farmers. Uh, big if. Uh, that's a story for another talk. Um, so, to finish up, here's uh, pulling together my threads of thought. So, uh, I sense as I look at the data, both here in the US and elsewhere in the world, that we're actually in an era of slower and perhaps even still slowing agricultural productivity growth. If you think about the, the lags involved in this R&D spending, that what we've been doing over the last few years in the rich countries is going to carry forward over the next decade or two, notwithstanding any policy changes we make now, which could turn those things around, but I think the, the inertia and momentum in those systems are, are such that we're likely to see some slower agricultural productivity growth over the years ahead. Uh, we see clearly in these data retreat by the world's richest countries from their historical role as principal providers of the global public goods of agricultural science. So in the early days of the CG system, there was a huge presence of the US and the CGIR, both in human capital and investments and so forth. You don't see that as much these days. It's still important, uh, but not big. And we're seeing new institutional arrangements emerge between Brazil and China and sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. And so my sense is the ground shifting. Uh, in terms of, uh, of the, the public goods component of agricultural science. It will take a while to play out, and the US system is still a biggie uh, and, will play, and will play a big role for decades to come. I'm talking about something that will take a while to play out, not going to happen tomorrow. Um, an ever-increasing share of R&D in the rich countries is directed off-farm issues, so we've had this creeping move towards pr more proprietary, i.e. privately performed research. They'd, related but different things. There's a lot of proprietary research done in public institutions as well. Um, and a fair bit of that is off-farm, post-farm in particular. But even within the land grants and the USDAs, we've seen a shift in the orientation away from things that, that focused on farm productivity and addressing issues of environmental concerns, um, uh, food safety concerns, all things where there's constituents and arguments and economic value to perhaps be had. But because we've had this expanding agenda in public agricultural research at the same time we've had a slowing or a cutback in R&D spending, something has to give, and what's been given, giving is investments on maintaining or enhancing productivity growth. As best I can do, I trolled through all the CRIS data, and my estimates are that we've gone from about 68 69% of all of the land grant and USDA spending going on maintaining or enhancing productivity down to barely 54%. So barely half of what goes on in the experiment stations now has got anything to do with farm productivity. You saw on the data I just showed you this pretty stable relationship that as per capita incomes rise, and conversely, as the ag share of the economy falls, we tend to increase the intensive investments in agricultural R&D. Uh, and crystal ball gazing is not my best forte, and the, the future is definitely uncertain, but I think in these data there is clear evidence of a shift and an, a, perhaps evidence of an emerging new world order with respect to ag R&D. Thank you very much. Yeah. Time for Does your information indicate that uh, China, India, uh, are conducting their administrative uh, decisions uh, in a better way than the U.S. and the other uh, developed countries, question number one. And question number two, will this situation actually lead to a kind of a actual monopoly of uh, China and India on, on know-how and patents and uh, whichever in respect to egg technologies? Uh, uh, those two countries doing things better, uh, uh, hard to get a yardstick on that. Um, by better, are they making more, say, economically rational decisions on where and what they do their research on? I think it's really hard to call. Uh, 
they've certainly, at, at a macro policy level, they've made a, a really critical uh, decision to sustain these investments in public goods ag R&D. This is on public sector ag R&D for decades. Uh, the rich countries haven't done that. Uh, so their macro policy decisions about how much to spend and the direction of spending relative to all the evidence I see about the returns to this R&D. I mean, a common question I get is, oh, we've, all the easy gains have been got. You know, do we, but I, I spend a lifetime looking at and trying to put value on things you guys do, gals do for a living. Uh, I see no evidence uh, done carefully that the returns to recent investments in R&D are any lower or higher than they were to investments done 50 or 80 years ago. Um, Again, you've got to be careful of how you do that. People confuse the slowing down in yields as signs of, oh, innovation and agriculture slowing down. But as I said, just to sustain yields, when you've got changing environmental and economic pressures on agriculture, to sustain past yields takes investment, and that has value. If you didn't do the R&D, that value would be lost. All right? So you have to count that value into the part of the returns to R&D. So I think you know, the policy decision to sustain the investments for the long run uh, that decision is being better done in other countries of the world rather than the US and even the Australias and so forth, which have started to, to, to falter in terms of their R&D spending. Um, the monopoly question, uh, uh, I think that's a long way off. Um, I, I do a lot of work on intellectual property rights and I don't see evidence in the data uh, of any sort of countrywide monopolization of knowledge going on. Again, this, the, for, you don't want to think synonymously that private, pu public research is public good research, because increasingly in our situations, a lot of that's encumbered by intellectual property as well, so they're not synonymous. Uh, my estimates are that 90%, there are 85 to 90% of all of the world's private food and ag R&D still takes place in the rich countries. That's changing though, and it's, that's hard to actually tease out. So you might have companies that are based here, but where in the world are they doing their research? As I look carefully at the data, that's shifting as well. All right, so you've got companies like um, Hormel, uh, based in Minnesota, uh, have opened up uh, research facilities in Shanghai and so forth. So they're trying to target and get their research closer to, and I would expect a lot of food research is going to be increasingly done offshore by these companies to sort of tap into local demand, uh, idiosyncratic sort of behaviour and so forth and target those markets very carefully with the form and function of the foods they're delivering into those markets. Very hard to do sitting in Minnesota to target Chinese pallets, you know. So my sense is there'll be a lot of offshoring of that private research over the next 20 to 30 years, more so uh, in some areas than in other areas because of concerns of piracy seed piracy and things like that might inhibit the movement out of Europe and the US of, say, the biological sciences into developing countries. So it's a, it's a, it's a com there's a complex set of factors in play there. It's not just a, a, a clear cut and dried sort of story. So we'll take a quick question. Okay. Uh, Kulvinder Gill, Washington State University. So what I'm trying to get a sense of is what one dollar of R&D get you in different countries. Uh, the, the, the reason of the question is that we have talked India and China and everyone there is aware of the growing population, one billion plus. Uh, so farmers and the policymakers, they're all very aware and then intensive agriculture, unsustainable type of agriculture. So just a, a short question. So is there a good way to measure what one dollar of each public do dollar in R&D get you in terms of output that can be measured uh, such that if that, that dollar was not spent, what would be the effect? Yeah, there's a, um, it's uh a tough thing to do, but uh, economists are used to making assumptions and, and diving into deep water. And so there's, there's a lot of economic analysis exactly targeted to trying to think about what the, the economic returns are in terms of the benefits for every dollar that's spent. Uh, in fact, I and colleagues, we just posted it on the website of my centre, we just finished a, a compilation of all the uh, rates of return studies that we could find globally. We have like 73 countries in the data set, uh, 360 studies. Um, and very healthy rates of returns. No sign that there's much systematic differences across geography in those returns. And as I said earlier, no signs that, that the returns now are high, uh, demonstrably higher or lower than they were from research done in yesteryear. So 
yes, the imp imprecise as they are, there are estimates around there trying to link the returns for a dollar to, to its impact on, on output and putting a value on that output. And is there any trend globally? Sorry, is there any what? Is there any trend like richer country or poor country? No, as I say, I don't see any, any change in the data across geography or across uh, time in that data. It, it still is a really good way of spending public dollars, actually. It's, uh, it has, you know, along with investments in, in education and probably aspects of infrastructure, it pays really handsomely high rates of returns. Thank you. Okay, well, this has been very thought-provoking. Uh, so let's thank uh, Phil, and I will see you back here in about 20 minutes, I think. So. here during the break, so if you have other questions, um, please feel free.